I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2020. The climate crisis is a worldwide disaster. And much like a pandemic, it has no geographical boundaries, nor can we downplay it in hopes it'll just magically evaporate in the dead of summer, or in any season for that matter. As we all witnessed, that plan didn't quite pan out. And if I can draw one more comparison, the effects of climate change, much like COVID-19, don't affect every group of people the same. Why does climate change disproportionately impact communities of color? Yeah, so from my perspective, and this is my perspective, it, it is rooted in racism. These communities are particularly minority communities that do not have the political connection, do not have the resources to, to, to kind of push back and fight. Studies have shown that black and Latinx communities throughout the U.S. are exposed to far more air pollution than they actually produce. It's no wonder most people in the U.S. overwhelmingly support climate action. Most of us are vulnerable to its effects. Finally, a crisis every American can rally behind. So Obama is talking about all of this with the global warming and the, that. And a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? It's a hoax. If only. The majority of all Americans agree that the federal government isn't doing enough for the environment, from protecting water and air quality to developing alternative sources of energy. Just last month, longtime climate science denier David LeGates was appointed by the Trump administration to help run NOAA. You know, the federal agency responsible for conducting climate research. Arguably more depressing than climate change itself is the fact that, at worst, there are people who don't believe it's real, or at best, have no interest in working to mitigate its effects. But we're not here to talk about climate change deniers, flat earthers, QAnon, or people who believe Jimmy from Degrassi is in the Illuminati. We don't have time. The polar ice caps are melting, wildfires are burning, the jet streams are being disrupted, all while politicians are playing politics with the planet. And if you were hoping for some silver lining about how lockdowns and social distancing might have curbed our collective carbon footprint. <laughs> A huge reduction in nitrogen dioxide or NO2 over places like China, Italy and France. One unexpected effect of this rapid shutdown has been that Venice's typically murky canals are running clear for the first time in years. Why would you do that to yourself? Have you learned nothing from 2020? As people all over the world stayed home to stop the spread of coronavirus, greenhouse gas emissions from energy and transport industries dropped to record lows. Cool, right? We were literally saving the planet one hand in a bag of tackies, the other on our Instacart apps. But wait, there's more. Even with a small blip of COVID-related reductions, we're still emitting tons of carbon dioxide, which means the effects of climate change are still very much present. I am the climate editor at Atmos Magazine. We're a new climate and culture publication uh, where I'm reporting on environmental justice. Much of my work revolves around reporting on the crisis as it relates to people, as it relates to people of color. Or for much of the time that the environment has been an issue, it's been treated as something separate from us, right? Something that affects wildlife, something that affects the oceans. People are being impacted now, and the people who are being impacted the most right now are people of color. Environmental racism, it's such a confusing concept for a lot of people. Like, how can the environment be racist? Can you break down for us what environmental racism actually is? Well, it's not the environment that's being racist to us. It's the way that our leaders, who have you know, long been white, older dudes, have created and built our society. It's, for instance, you know, black and Latinx people are more likely to live near sources of pollution, uh, hazardous waste sites what people are talking about when they're talking about environmental racism. Who gets access to green space? Who gets access to clean air? And I remember when the pandemic first began, right? I mean, New York was ground zero. So living in New York, I think, has just highlighted, like, there are some of us who have that luxury of, like, running away and escaping disaster. And there are some of us who have to sit here and brace for impact. The resiliency of the people who live in New York has been incredibly inspiring. It is seeing the way that people have built community throughout all this, throughout the pandemic. If, if our leaders want to address the climate crisis, they need to listen to the science. Part of the reason why they're not doing anything about it on both sides of the aisle is because they are so heavily enmeshed with the fossil fuel industry. We need more regular people in Congress. We need people who are not being funded by these giant corporations. Meanwhile, devastating wildfires fueled by hot, dry winds 
has scorched millions of acres across the western United States. And as we scan to the west, uh, it gets worse. And if that wasn't enough... I had a tree limb fell in my bathroom. The whole tree fell on my roof in the back. We're experiencing one of the busiest hurricane seasons in the Atlantic, sparked by warming sea surface temperatures. And because warmer air holds more moisture, storms are now wetter, contributing to rising seas and increasing the chances of devastating storm surges. By now, if you're not experiencing some level of crisis fatigue, I'd encourage you to check your pulse. Maybe another way of dealing with all this bad news is by grabbing a few of your best friends for a camping trip in Joshua Tree or for some snorkeling along Florida's coastal reefs. Only that one friend who's always side-eyeing you for using plastic straws at brunch will likely remind you that the effects of climate change are having a devastating impact there too. Left unprotected, influencer meccas like these won't remain nearly as grammable for future generations. The Joshua Trees are dying. This national park is one of only two places in the entire world where these trees can even grow, but what if they can't grow here anymore? Climate change seems set to kill 90% of the Joshua trees by the end of this century. And if something isn't done, the 1.2 million photos of them on Instagram are gonna be nothing more than digital history. Again, my name is Mason, that's Captain Travis. Mason Bodner works for a boat company that takes divers to see the coral reefs. And it's very hard working in this industry, trying to explain to people, hey, it's still this beautiful and you still need to come out here and see it, but you also need to understand what we've done to it um, and what we continue to do to it. The ocean absorbs 90% of the excess heat in the atmosphere, and corals can't survive in excessively warm waters. But whether we see them die or not, scientists say we will all feel the effects if corals go extinct. The degradation of these ecosystems is a huge problem for the health of the planet, not to mention the generations of Joshua Tree Band Californians who will have to ingest their psychedelics elsewhere. Bearing the immediate brunt of climate change, aside from wildlife, is, well, everyone, but especially farmers. Forced to choose between breathing in toxic fumes and earning a much needed paycheck, these essential workers have had to make impossibly difficult choices. Reduce outdoor activities if you can see or smell smoke. Good advice as hundreds of fires rage from the Bay Area to here in Ventura County, creating a hazy soup, sometimes obliterating entire hillsides. Nos afectan los ojos en, en el cuerpo. She told us how the smoke irritates her eyes and other parts of her body, including her lungs. But she has to work, she says, to feed her family and pay the rent. Forget the intense physical component of a job most of us wouldn't last a day doing. Farm workers have had to confront extreme heat, wildfire smoke, and a respiratory virus. About half of U.S. farm workers are undocumented, which means they aren't eligible for government benefits and can't afford to miss work, so they're hesitant to complain. I complain after five minutes of uncontrollable upper lip sweat waiting in line to get into Whole Foods on a hot day. Where else can you get pre-made kale guacamole or gluten-free sparkling water in a pinch? Nowhere. And in addition to feeling the direct impacts of climate change in the fields, these farm workers, the majority of whom are Latinx, are part of communities that are more likely to live near pollutants. In fact, nearly half of Latinxes in this country live in the top 15 worst areas for ground level ozone pollution including three states most impacted by the climate crisis, California, Texas, and Florida. I know I'm gonna get pushback on this, but Latinx people in South Florida aren't just a bunch of really great salsa dancers with hot bods, perfect dance, and reggaeton obsessions. We care about things like the environment and clean air and protecting endangered species. Why else would we still be listening to Daddy Yankee? A little less gasolina, a little more hybrid plug-ins, am I right? The fact is, evidence of environmental injustice affecting black and brown communities comes directly from the EPA. If you're familiar with the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, or the controversial Dakota Pipeline at Standing Rock, you're likely well acquainted with the concept. The EPA's own research found a direct link between America's racial geography and disproportionate exposure to particulate matter, as in microscopic carcinogens like smog, ash, dust, and fumes. And yes, I've ingested worse things at Burning Man parties in downtown LA, but we're talking chronic long-term exposure, and that's way too many hours of house music even for me. Despite this awareness, the Trump administration continues to roll back regulations on pollution, which means 
unless we take immediate action, these problems are going to get worse. But cane is mostly in, in this area, sugar cane. And the other, it's no other work, mostly. But if they stop burning, it will help uh, the environment, it'll help the peoples in the West, and it'll help the, the, the breeding situation and, and the pollution. About 25% of sugar harvest in the United States comes from this region, where it generates more than 12,000 jobs, and in turn, a community that relies heavily on the industry. They check, you know, the wind conditions, which way it's blowing, and all that, you know, that way we know where to start, so we can try to control where the, where the um, ashes go. Hernando Saldivar has worked on the fields in charge of the burner for the past two seasons. If the wind's blowing out, towards you know out towards the east they don't do it you know or if the president comes in they don't they're not allowed to do it either so if president trump is in maralago you don't burn you can't you're not allowed to not even if it's burning west you're not allowed to how do you feel about that mm, it's wrong you know i mean he's like i said he's just a human like us you know why does his life matter more than ours every year october marks the beginning of sugar cane burning season which stretches till april Regulations specify that if the wind is blowing towards eastern Palm Beach County's more populated and affluent coastal cities, then they cannot burn. But if the wind is blowing towards the west, towards mainly black and brown communities around Lake Okeechobee, then the regulations are minimal. We met Amalia Rangel in Belgrade, one of the largest communities in the area. Yo ya tengo 22 años viviendo aquí. Uh -huh. Yo trabajé casi 15 años en la labor de la caña. Yo tengo tres nietos y, y ellos con, con este caso de la casa, siempre cuando se quema la caña, ellos siempre les sufren de alergias. We caught up with her at a trailer park across a sugar cane field where she lives with her daughter and her kids, Xavier, Allison, and Roberto. I start to cough and a lot of allergies just come in whenever it comes down. When you smell smoke, it kind of feels kind of weird. It kind of feels weird. Yeah, it feels like the oxygen is kind of getting low for me. National studies have shown that people of color are more likely to live in counties with higher levels of pollution, and that black people, Latinx, and Asians run a higher risk of premature death from inhaling particle pollution. Come January 2021, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services is slated to roll out a program to enhance what they call prescribed burning all the while defending the practice as a successful model to manage agricultural lands. Stop the burn advocates. The local activists argue that the regulations do little for the health and well-being of the glades and its people. We're not asking them to do something that's going to destroy their, their business. We're asking them to move up into the 21st century. One lone wolf stepping out from his political pack is Carlos Curbelo a former Republican congressman and co-founder of the Climate Solutions Caucus, a bipartisan group in Congress exploring policy options to address climate change. Obviously, I needed to see for myself that such a political unicorn was real. Now, because of your views on climate science, I have referred to you as somewhat of a political unicorn. <laughs> Thank you. I realized when I got to Congress that there was a crisis there because no one was even talking about this issue inside the Republican Party. See, a lot of people think the issue is denialism, that Republicans just don't accept the science. That's not the big challenge. Most Republicans fully understand and accept the challenge. Apathy uh, or fear of the issue is the big challenge. So this is a real issue for us. This isn't uh, some debate in theory about what could be or not. It's about uh, a challenge that we're facing locally in places like the Florida Keys, Miami Beach, and others. You co-founded a caucus with U.S. legislators to address climate action. Can you tell me about some specific policy proposals that you might have been a part of um, to do just that? So our, our number one goal was to establish a dialogue. That worked. Our number two goal was to block anti-climate legislation, which we successfully did. And then the number three goal, which is kind of the phase the caucus is in now, is developing those proactive solutions, that positive policy agenda. And there's some great ideas out there. Look, carbon capture. This is a new technology where 
uh, as plants generate energy, uh, there's a filtering system that captures carbon, prevents it from going up into the atmosphere, and then stores it so that that carbon is, doesn't contribute to uh, pollution. Action on climate change translates to good economic policy and it all trickles down. I hope that in a century this place, the Betsy Hotel, isn't underwater. It is all connected. So if you're for a prospering economy, you have to be for a healthy environment. The U.S. isn't the only country where environmentalism and politics clash. Throughout Latin America, controversial developments and policies have been pitting communities against each other for a long time. The difference is, depending on where you live, environmental activism can be a far more dangerous game. As in, you might die, and not because of the air quality. In 2018 alone, more than 160 environmental activists were killed around the globe, with more than half of those killings taking place in Latin America leading me to wonder if these activists are becoming as endangered as the natural habitats they're trying to protect. Widespread deforestation and billion dollar development deals throughout this part of the world have threatened some of the most biologically rich habitats on the planet. And a lot of the time, the only barrier to these environmental catastrophes is just a few activists armed with really big bravery. Seriously, their bravery is huge. My name is Silvio Carrillo. I'm a journalist based in the Bay Area, and I'm the nephew of Berta Cáceres, and we've been fighting for justice uh, for her case in Honduras for almost five years now. My aunt was a woman who her whole life had been fighting for indigenous rights in Honduras. In 2015, Berta um, was recognized for her 25 years of work, she gained notoriety, won the uh, Goldman Prize, which is considered the Nobel Prize for the environment. So uh, there was a dam being built in Lenca territory in Honduras. Lenca are an indigenous uh, people who live in Honduras. The owners of the dam, who had a lot of help and support from the government, decided she was too much of a threat. Um, and she was going to be too much of a threat for that project and potentially other projects and so they had her killed. In 2016, the day before her birthday, a couple of men went into her house and assassinated her. Uh, seven men were charged. They are simply trigger men. Um, the man that was the supposed intellectual author is in the midst of his trial currently. We're talking almost five years on since her murder. There's been no real attempt at justice. This is a, a normal thing in Latin America where conservative governments, right-wing governments, supported by the U.S., open up their countries for logging, for manufacturing. The U.S. wants to take our resources in Latin America. This is our Goliath. People are becoming, in a way, environmental refugees because our lands in Latin America are being destroyed. What is at stake in Latin America for land defenders is their lives. I mean, uh, there's, there's no better evidence of that than and Berta, you knew she was fearless. You knew she was speaking truth to power. Our indigenous people have a connection, a direct connection to the land. Um, and they are the ones who should be taking care of it and lead, leading the way for us to learn from them on how to take care of it. There is one Latin American country that's been celebrated for its environmental policy by activists, surfers, and stoners alike. Costa Rica. The Costa Rican government believes that decarbonizing the economy makes both economic and social sense, challenging the usual trope that fighting climate change will eliminate jobs and stifle development. Ticos believe that sustainability and growth go hand in hand. Even though recently there has been growing conflict between the country's indigenous communities and farmers over land ownership, Costa Rica's environmental credentials are impressive. More than 98% of the country's energy is renewable, Forest cover is at more than 53%, and a quarter of the country's land is federally protected. Costa Rican President Carlos Alvarado Quesada claims sustainable development is very much in the DNA of Costa Ricans. And for a country who abolished its military 70 years ago, leads the region in health and primary education, and is working to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, I'd say the rest of us could stand to clone a genome or two. 
conservamos, protegemos, tenemos un cliente satisfecho porque logró el objetivo de, de ver esas cosas lindas que teníamos en el país. And through smaller, more grassroots efforts, the citizens of other Latin American countries are mobilizing. They're schooling us on how to preserve their local communities while also tackling socioeconomic inequalities. These recyclers walk the avenues of Bogota in search of plastic waste, material they'll soon convert into plastic lumber to build a home for someone in need. Part of our project is to build a home for recyclers. Every family dreams of having a house of their own. The motivated employees sort through, clean, and help transform the material. And with it, they're able to build structures like these. Nunca, nunca pensé yo tener una casa así tan bonita. After working for the recycling plant her entire adult life, Carmen says this home has changed her life, and the rewards for her and all of the employees at the recycling plant are twofold. La primera satisfacción es eh, estamos aportando un granito de arena, eh, quitando plásticos del medio ambiente. When it comes to the protection of Mexico City's last forest frontier, a brigade known as the Tlalcoyotes or Badgers in Aztec are in the forefront of the fight against climate change. Parte de la identidad que tenemos como como originarios de la comunidad de Milpalta, pues es, es la defensa del territorio. The fact is, the forest serves as one of the primary sources of rain collection for the most populous city in Latin America, where three of every 10 liters that Mexico City consumes come directly from here. Building natural barriers to keep fires from spreading deep into the 250,000 hectares of forest, these 17 women and 16 men share one collective mission. Resguardar, salvaguardar el bosque. Los animales, las especies. Most people living in Latin America want their communities to be safe and habitable so that they won't be forced to leave. Take the caravans, for example. Remember those? The ones full of so-called bad hombres? The migrant caravan is growing. The group fleeing violence and poverty in Central America has pushed through Mexico's southern border. We're going to keep moving forward, this man says. He's been traveling for more than a week with his two-year-old daughter. The thing is, they were actually migrants from countries like Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, forced from their homes due to systemic corruption, gang violence, and climate change. Since 2014, the increase in migration from Central America's dry corridor directly coincides with years of severe drought, and lack of food is the primary reason people leave. Considering one of the obsessions, I mean, priorities of President Trump and Republicans is halting immigration, You'd think they'd at least acknowledge the role that climate change plays in driving it? Then again, that would require they actually believe it is a crisis. I think we want to work with you to really recognize the changing climate and what it means to our forest. It'll start getting cooler. <laughs> I you wish just, you just watch. But if our current administration isn't ready to step up to science, an entire coalition of Latinx advocacy groups are. The Latino Victory Project is leading a campaign to support Hashtag Vote Like a Madre, a climate change focused campaign directed at Latinx matriarchs. Pinky promised your kids that this election you'll vote like a madre, that you will choose candidates with bold plans to fight climate change. The campaign is a part of a broader push to increase turnout in several Latinx heavy states. And no, I'm not suggesting that JLo is the answer to the climate crisis. But I'm also not suggesting she's not. We put a reality TV show host in charge of the nuclear launch codes, so I'd say using celebrities to convey a message is effective, for better or for much, much worse. Also, maybe her eternal youth superpower could help reverse the planet's current trajectory of deterioration? No? Vote Like a Madre urges people to support climate plans that acknowledge climate change is human-made, that shift resources toward renewable energy, and that protect vulnerable communities from pollution. Because Latinx communities care about environmental justice and sustainability, and always have. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2020. See you guys next week. Thanks for watching Radar 2020. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below, and let us know what issues are important to you. But only the important ones, because the frivolous ones are like so 2019. <laughs>